Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, to today's Boundless Immigration Live. My name is Maggie Riley. I am the Immigration Law and Policy Analyst here at Boundless Immigration, and I'm coming here today to talk a little bit about um, preparing for USCIS interviews, especially now during this latest Omicron surge in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've received a lot of questions. Um, we always receive a lot of questions from people about how they can get ready for the interview, what sort of documents might be needed, um, what kind of rules they need to know about before they arrive. And in the context of the pandemic, uh, we are still getting those questions and even more. And so I wanted to pop on here today and take a little bit of time just to talk about some of the changes that USCIS has announced and the guidelines, what you can expect um, when you go to a USCIS interview. So before we really wanted to jump in, I just want to tell you a little bit about me and uh, sort of set a, uh, a ground rule, as it were. So um, I am an immigration attorney. I've been an immigration attorney for several years now. Um, but I don't represent private clients. I just work for Boundless. And so what that means is that anything I'm saying here today is going to be general information. So I'm not giving anyone specific legal advice. I can't answer questions about specific situations. I'm just here to um, talk about my experiences working in the immigration system, the trends that we've seen here at Boundless, and share information about what you can expect um, at the USCIS interviews um, and what their rules are. If you do have any questions about your immigration status or path to citizenship, I recommend that you talk with an immigration attorney. Um, you can find one at alalawyer.com, um, but just uh, so that y'all are all aware there, I'm not giving any direct legal advice today, just sharing general information from USCIS. So all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in. So one of the big questions right now for people is, are interviews even happening? Is USCIS scheduling interviews? Are they still going forward? And the short answer is yes. Um, USCIS uh, is still scheduling interviews um, and the interviews that have already been scheduled in general are still meant to go forward. Um, USCIS in general is going to send out that interview notice and once you receive it, you better show up at that interview. Failure to show up at an interview will usually result in the application being denied. So it's very important that if they sent um, an interview notice and they did not send a cancellation or a reschedule notice, still attend that interview. Um, USCIS uh, recently announced um, that they are also going to be um, potentially rescheduling some interviews due to the Omicron surge. So for some of you who have been going through the consulate process overseas, you already know that consulates tend to operate based on whatever the local conditions are. So in some parts of the world, COVID is a much um, bigger risk than it is in other places. And so for the past two years or so, most of the consulates have been functioning under some variety of COVID restriction if they're not just closed entirely. Um, the immigration courts also earlier this week issued um, basically a pause on all standing orders. And so they're pausing a lot of hearings in immigration courts as well because of this um, most recent Omicron wave. However, USCIS is still moving forward with interviews, but like the consulates, it's going to depend on where you live and how serious the COVID uh, case numbers and um, risk of exposure is there. This, of course, also leads into staffing shortages, which a lot of you have probably read about on the news. So USCIS officers get sick as well, um, you know, and so that can also lead to short staffing and it can lead to the need for USCIS to reschedule interviews because they don't have enough officers available on a given day. USCIS updated their website on Tuesday of this week, so that would be January 12th. They updated their website to say that in some areas they may need to reschedule interviews due to the Omicron surge. If they reschedule an interview, they said that they will mail a written notice to the applicant and the petitioner or the sponsor. Um, so, but they will mail that notice. if you don't receive a mailed notice from USCIS, if they haven't officially rescheduled, you should assume that that interview is still going forward. So uh, they are still doing um, interviews. Check your local guidance. USCIS posts field, posts field office closures on its website. And so you can um, check in with them and make sure on the day of or the day before your appointment, whether or not the office is gonna be closed. So. 
Your interview then has been scheduled. You didn't get a reschedule notice, so you're wondering now, what are the rules when I get to USCIS? What are the COVID guidelines? What are they doing to keep us all safe? So um, the first thing that you're going to need to know is that USCIS offices are federal buildings. And so therefore, because this is a federal space, everyone inside is required to wear a mask. This goes for federal employees. It goes for contractors that are working for the federal government in the USCIS offices. And it also goes for visitors. So if you are the applicant, if you are the spouse of an applicant, if you are the translator or the attorney, uh, you are going to have to wear a mask. Uh, bring one from home. Um, an N95 um, is generally the recommended mask. USCIS um, does say on their website that if you bring a face covering that is uh, they don't think is sufficient or good enough, they will offer you another mask. Um, it's probably best to just save the trouble and bring a proper mask from home. Um, they also um, ask that uh, if you have tested positive for COVID, and these are the new rules, and this is where there's a bit of confusion. If you have tested positive for COVID-19 in the last 14 days, if you have been exposed to somebody who has tested positive for COVID-19 in the last 14 days, USCIS is going to ask you to most likely going to re schedule your interview. Now this is because even though the CDC released guidance around the five day end of quarantine for individuals who are exposed, be it vaccinated or not, USCIS has its own guidance and its guidance is a 14 day time limit. The USCIS guidance supersedes any local guidance. So if you live in a state that has no mask mandates, you still have to wear a mask at USCIS. Their guidance uh, will be controlling. Um, if you live somewhere that does not have requirements regarding isolation, um, same thing. USCIS is holding this 14-day rule. Um, it is set on their website, and anecdotally, there have been reports of people who were asymptomatic, had tested positive, wore a mask, um, but were asked to uh, reschedule their appointment due to the recent COVID exposure. In those situations, USCIS handles the reschedule, and so generally a new notice would be mailed as well as uh, how it was done the first time. So keep in mind, if you've been exposed, um, if you've tested positive, you are going to need to um, essentially request a reschedule if you have been, uh, if you have an interview scheduled in that next 14 days. Another rule at USCIS is that you have traveled internationally or domestically or on a cruise ship within 10 days before your interview. So um, for a lot of folks, they think of international travel as being what is going to trigger that concern about quarantine. Um, USCIS essentially thinks, and with some science to back them up, that travel domestically or internationally is going to create enough of a risk that they're gonna ask you to quarantine for 10 days prior to your interview. Uh, in the event that an interview has already been scheduled for you, uh, you're going to have to think carefully about whether you think it's worth traveling versus rescheduling your interview. Um, keep in mind that um, it is very serious to be untruthful or to lie to an immigration officer, and that can have very serious and long-term consequences for your case. So whenever you're making decisions about what you're going to do, just keep in mind that honesty really truly is the best policy. Um, and so finally, as far as your um, COVID exposures, like I said, um, you do, do not need to show that you've been vaccinated to attend an interview, but you do need to show um, you cannot attend if you have um, tested positive or are currently symptomatic for COVID-19. Fully vaccinated still means two doses of a two-dose regimen. So that would be like the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, or two weeks after the one dose regimen, such as a Johnson & Johnson. So it does include that two week period after you get the jab. Um, finally, another random note regarding what you might um, consider bringing with you to USCIS interviews. They do recommend that you bring your own blue and black ink pens. I like to toss that in there. It's an odd one that they added at the beginning of the pandemic, but in general, I think it's just never a bad idea. You will have to um, sign your forms in ink. If you bring your own, it just um, saves, I suppose, cross-contamination. Um, but I always like to toss that one in there. 
And then, all right, so I do see some questions in there. We're going to try to circle back to those towards the end if we get some time, all right? Um, I did want to talk about um, some other things that you can go ahead and bring to the interview. So some questions that we've gotten regarding the interview is, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people have really limited their social gatherings. They aren't um, going to movies or baseball games or, um, you know, holiday parties or whatever the various um, social events that they usually would be going out to with their family members or partners. Um, this is often really um, good evidence for folks who are applying to show that their um, relationship is ongoing and continuous and what immigration authorities call a bona fide relationship. So that means a relationship that is a real genuine relationship um, and not for the purposes of getting a green card or some other immigration benefit. Um, so often people like to you know, submit evidence of travel they've taken together, photos of them out and about, photos with each other's families. For many people during the pandemic, that hasn't been as possible as before. Um, like anything else, when proving your relationship, um, your individual situation, those facts matter. Um, what you're doing when you are submitting an application to USCIS or um, attending your interview is telling the story of your relationship in a way that is easy to understand for immigration. It shows your genuine relationship and that you meet all the requirements to receive the green card or visa that you're requesting. So. Uh, we've all had to get kind of creative during the COVID-19 pandemic with how we deal with various situations in our life, and this is no different. So if you haven't been traveling together, other options can include um, if you still have had um, WhatsApp, uh, FaceTime, Zoom, Skype, Google Meet calls with each other's families or with each other. Um, I know many people had a family member attend Thanksgiving or, you know, New Year's celebrations um, out over Zoom because they weren't able to travel at the time. And so a screenshot of your family together electronically can do just as much as um, that physical photo could have done. Um, it's really about showing the interconnection and the intermingling of your lives and your families. Um, and so, you know, things just are what they are right now. And so, you know, we can get creative in other ways. Um, perhaps if you haven't been going out doing things in public, but maybe you've taken an online cooking course together. Um, I had a few friends who did that as a couple, and so they were able to submit the itinerary, and then they took some home photos of um, cooking together and screenshots of the course when they all sort of prevent, presented their meals at the end. So. Even though you're not able to do things physically or to travel in the way that maybe you've been able to in the past, a lot of us have found ways to sort of move our lives digitally online so that we're not missing out on everything. And so I'd recommend thinking about how have you adapted in your life to the pandemic and then how can you turn around and show that um, to the USCIS officers. So think about, um, like I said, online courses. Are you doing movie nights with friends and family over Amazon Prime? Are you having watch parties? Um, outdoor picnics, um, for those of you who are fortunate enough to live in good climates might still be an option. Um, but yeah, think really carefully about how you've sort of shifted um, into sort of a digital space without sounding too futuristic. And then think about how you can show that to the USCIS officers. Um, another question we had seen about um, relating to vaccination, and this one is more about coming into the country. Um, so if you have been applying from outside the United States for um, either a K-1 visa for your partner or um, a green card for your spouse, um, the, your partner who is immigrating will need to be vaccinated to enter the United States. There are some medical exemptions for this that are laid out in the USCIS policy manual. But by and large, everybody who is immigrating into the United States will need to show that they've been vaccinated against COVID-19. For United States citizen sponsors, it's a little bit different. So U.S. citizens and U.S. green card holders do not have to be vaccinated to enter the United States, but they do have to show, uh, if they're not vaccinated, they will still have to show that they have received a negative COVID test within the past 24 to 72 hours. 
Um, for a lot of people, this can be really difficult to pull off logistically. Just the timing, especially with delays and getting testing and then testing results, can mean that you might be cutting it pretty close on getting those test results before um, your time comes to fly. Um, so in general, that's another thing to keep in mind when you're making decisions about how you want to handle um, the medical portions when traveling. But for somebody who is going to be flying into the United States, either as an immigrant who has received a green card or on a K-1 visa, you are going to need to show that you have been vaccinated against COVID-19 or that you have a medical exemption um, otherwise. Um, I think I touched on this previously as well. You do not need to show that you've been vaccinated to enter a USCIS field office for an interview. But again, if you have tested positive um, or have been exposed to someone who has tested positive within 14 days, or you've traveled internationally or domestically within 10 days, they are gonna ask you to reschedule your interview. So just be prepared for that. Um, to quickly touch on um, the vaccines one more time, at the end there, I had mentioned you are going to need to show that you're vaccinated to enter the United States. At this time, the CDC has not updated their um, guidance as to which vaccines are um, accepted. So it has not changed since I spoke with y'all a couple of weeks ago. So we're still, um, the United States is still accepting proof that you've been vaccinated with either the Pfizer-BioNTech, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Covaxin, Covishield, BIBP, or the Sinopharm, or Sinovac. Um, I did see a question as well. Both spouses do not need to be vaccinated at the interview just to travel into the United States on the visa. So if you're coming from outside the United States, you're going to have to show vaccination if you're not a U.S. citizen. Um, but the rules are different for the U.S. citizens versus folks who are coming into the country as travelers or as immigrants. So... Um, that touches on most of the COVID questions I think I got. Um, I did see another question come through earlier in the chat. Um, while on the process to enter the U.S. as a spouse of a U.S. citizen, can the U.S. citizen live in the foreign country with a family um, you, on a multi, I think it's supposed to be on a multi-year visa, and does that affect the U.S. process in any way? So um, I will start by saying that I am a U.S. immigration attorney, so my knowledge base is particular to U.S. immigration. But what I can say here is that in general, if a U.S. citizen is living overseas with um, a spouse, uh, a partner, another family member, that that generally will not have a negative impact on a green card application for that family member when they come to the United States. However, it will impact the application in that the U.S. citizen, when they return to the United States, generally has to show that they are domiciled in the United States. Now, this can be a little bit um, complicated to explain sometimes, um, but domicile has a very particular meaning in the legal immigration world, um, sort of separate from just plain residence. So, for example, one can reside in one place and have domicile in another. Um, if a U.S. citizen is living overseas with a spouse and they intend to immigrate to the United States later, um, they will, of course, have to comply with whatever the immigration laws are in the country that they're living in. Um, but when the U.S. citizen is ready to return to the United States with their spouse, they're going to have to show the U.S. government that they're domiciled here. And usually that's done by showing that the U.S. citizen has maintained voter registration in the United States, has maintained um, essentially ties to the United States. So that can be shown by voter registration, as I just mentioned, uh, bank accounts open in the United States, property owned in the United States, that could be um, land, a home, it could be property kept in storage um, if somebody um, left and intended to return. So something that essentially shows that you have a continuing presence in the United States in some form. Um, and so in that way, yes, the U.S. citizen living overseas with the spouse, it can impact the application, but it doesn't necessarily harm the application in any way. It just adds this extra step for the U.S. citizen to show later on in the process. Um, and then finally, I think I may have received um, the same question twice, but I just want to make sure I cover it. Um, do both spouses need to be vaccinated against COVID at the interview? So one thing to clarify here is that um, overseas, when individuals interview at a consulate or the embassy for an immigrant visa, 
um, or for a K-1 visa or another visa of that sort, only the applicant is in the room with the consular officer. And so in um, a situation like that, um, even, even if both should be vaccinated um, per local regulations, for example, only the um, beneficiary is going to be the one in the room with the officer actually taking the interview. Um, in the United States, um, generally in the past, both parties in like a marriage green card interview would attend the interview together. During the COVID-19 pandemic, USCIS has tightened its entry entry guidelines into their field offices um, to help limit the risk of exposure and spread. And so visitors are actually limited to just the applicant, one attorney or representative if you have a lawyer who's going with you, and then if you have someone who is helping you by providing disability assistance. Um, even interpreters are generally gonna be asked to appear telephonically, which means to call in rather than to come into the room in person. Um, so in that case, um, in the United States, we don't have any requirements um, as far as vaccination for US citizens. Um, there's no mandate um, na nationally that people do be vaccinated. And so that is also not required to enter the USCIS field offices. So when I'm talking about this vaccination requirement for immigrants, it's specifically for people who are entering the country to get their green card. And it looks like I got one more question here. How about traveling while still in process? Does that affect just to go visit and to come back? So in general, um, a lot of immigration attorneys are um, very hesitant to give advice to anybody that they should travel <laughs> during this time. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, advanced parole um, does allow an individual to leave the country while their process is pending and then to re-enter. What you need to know though is that advanced parole doesn't guarantee that you're going to be allowed back into the country. Um, the uh, Customs and Border Pro uh, Protection Officers, CBP, at the airport or at the land border can still deny entry regardless of whether you have an approved advanced parole document. So that is always something to keep in mind. It's not necessarily the number one risk, but during a global pandemic when border closures and travel bans have been enacted and rolled back and enacted and rolled back, in general, you're going to want to think really carefully about the safety uh, for your immigration case of traveling. Um, you don't want to you know, leave the country for a quick vacation and then get stuck outside the country for a year, possibly missing your interview. Um, so that is something really important that you're going to want to um, keep in mind. Um, but as far as whether it impacts the processing um, for a green card, if you have that improved advanced parole in general, you're okay to leave the country and come back. But if you have specific questions, you should always talk to an immigration attorney first about your particular case, because there could be other um, issues lurking that you might have thought of, but a CBP officer might want to ask you about. So it's just always something to um, keep in mind. Uh, my rule of thumb during the pandemic has been if you don't need to travel, don't travel. Um, for personal safety, for the safety of a legal case, it's um, weighted out if you can. Obviously, that's not always possible, but if possible, it's generally um, safest, in my personal opinion, just to wait it out. And it looks like we've got a couple questions more coming in here. Now, I do want to remind everybody, I can't give specific advice about your particular situations, but I can give sort of general information related to these things, okay? Um, so as far as time estimates for the pandemic, yikes, that's a big question. It's really all over the place right now, unfortunately. Um, we did see a big climb in the K-1 backlog at USCIS, so that's the I-129F form that USCIS processes before they send the case to the Department of State for an interview. Um, I think that they jumped over 40% the number of cases pending last year. So anytime you're seeing an increase in backlogs like that, you're going to see sort of a knock-on effect in interviews also taking longer. 
Unfortunately, the double whammy as well for um, folks doing consular processing like K-1 um, is also that the consulates have been hit really, really hard by the pandemic. I think I mentioned earlier in this talk that some of them are still um, sort of barely open or functioning under various COVID restrictions. And because of that, um, the backlogs for interviews have really, really exploded. Um, there are a couple, I think there are about one and a half million family-based immigration cases um, in the backlog. Um, in the U.S., it really is highly variable. If you're applying for a green card, it's going to depend where you live. Um, New York City, you're looking at two to three years to get a green card. Um, smaller communities, if you live, um, you know, potentially somewhere like Ohio, um, I think it was Columbus, Ohio, a couple years ago was the fastest place to naturalize in the country by like a full year. Um, and so it's really going to depend on local conditions and local backlogs. Um, I know that's a, a frustrating answer. Um, it's the classic lawyer answer. It depends. Um, but there is a tool on the USCIS website. You can Google USCIS processing times, and that should give you a general time frame for the particular type of form that you are doing. Um, but in general, green cards, you're probably looking at one to two years, depending on where you live. Um, can a beneficiary travel domestically if they're already in the U.S. before immigration schedules an interview? Yes. Um, there are no rules preventing domestic travel. Um, again, if you, it's always going to depend on your particular situation and the level of risk you're comfortable taking. So, for example, um, someone who is undocumented, who lives maybe near the southern border or the Canadian border, might want to avoid Greyhound trips or something in that area because there tend to be stops. Um, but in general, there's no real problem with traveling domestically. The one thing you're going to need to remember is if the interview is scheduled, USCIS is going to want to reschedule your interview if you traveled domestically within 10 days. So um, if you've just filed and you've probably got six months, a year, 18 months before an interview, it's more likely going to be safer for you to go on a trip. If you're waiting for your interview and it's already been scheduled, probably better to sit it out and wait and celebrate afterwards. Um, if a beneficiary is applying for, uh, oh, sorry, is it best to hire a lawyer to come with the applicant to the interview? Um, that's a matter of personal opinion. I am an immigration attorney and in general, I find that that I, yes, that's what I think. I might have a bit of bias from my uh, background and training. Um, in general, for many people, um, a marriage-based green card interview is straightforward. Um, for folks that don't have questions about um, prior immigration violations or visa violations, who don't have um, questions about prior criminal history, um, who have sort of uh, what are frequently referred to as a clean cut case, um, then often really, um, it would not be considered necessary. And many, many, many people do attend their interviews successfully without an attorney present. Um, however, there is a little bit of a difference, um, I think probably between how, um, an interview might unfold between, um, an applicant and attorney and a USCIS officer versus just the officer and the applicant. Um, I don't say that to be frightening. It's just something that you do hear stories. Um, you know, sometimes you hear horror stories and you think, gosh, if there had been a lawyer there, they could have stopped that. Um, but in general, I do want to say that for most people, um, you don't need an attorney. But if it's going to give you peace of mind, there's nothing preventing you from doing it either. Um, there are immigration attorneys who will agree to attend just for an interview as long as they can review the file ahead of time. Um, that's always going to depend on the individual attorney, so I can't speak for the whole profession, obviously. Um, but if you can afford it and you think that it will be beneficial to you, there's um, it's certainly um, something that I think most attorneys at least would definitely recommend. Um, and if you have a complicated case or you have questions about, you know, whether you might end up triggering some kind of bar or having other issues down the road, I always highly advise that you speak with an immigration attorney just to make sure that you protect your options in the future. Um, 
If a beneficiary is applying for a marriage-based visa from inside of the U.S., do they need to be vaccinated? Uh, yes. So this is an interesting one because in general, there's no requirement that if you're in the United States that you must get vaccinated. So, um, you know, the government recently tried to put in place a workplace vaccine mandate. The Supreme Court ruled that they couldn't. Um, and so in general, um, the level of vaccination in the country is a function of people choosing to get vaccinated rather than being required to get vaccinated. The difference here is that um, if you were applying for a green card from inside the United States, by the time of your interview, you will need to submit a Form I-693 medical exam. And the medical exam, one of the new requirements of the medical exam is that COVID-19 vaccination. So earlier in the pandemic, obviously before the vaccines were created, it wasn't a requirement. And then there was sort of a window of time where the vaccines were out in the world, but the requirements in the medical exam didn't change. So if you're in the United States at the time you submit your application, um, technically speaking, you may not need to have already been vaccinated fully, but by the time um, you are gonna have to complete that medical exam by the time you attend your interview, and that medical exam is gonna need to show vaccination or that you have an approved exemption. Um, and that's something that would be handled by the um, doctor um, when you get your medical exam done. Um, I'm trying to just catch. I know we have had a lot of questions, so I just want to see how we're going. But I think we might have gotten all of our questions there. So I just wanted to circle back, give folks a beat to see if there's anything else they thought of that they wanted to ask about. Um, but barring that, um, I did want to thank everybody for joining. I hope that this has been informative. I know that there is a lot of changing information out there every day, um, not just around the pandemic, but around um, requirements with the government and immigration. And so I hope that we're able to answer your questions um, and get some of that information to you in a clear manner. Um, if you think of any more questions, please get in touch with us through our social media channels. You can get in touch with us here on Instagram. We're also live on Twitter and Facebook. So feel free to send us messages and we can um, make sure that we address your questions in our next live Q&A. So thank you so much, everybody. I hope you all have a fabulous day and stay safe out there.